Welcome everyone, we are very excited and happy uh, to have you join our Nint Morocco AI webinar of this AI webinar series. A brief intro about Morocco AI and who we are. Morocco AI is an initiative led by AI experts in Morocco and abroad. These experts are professors, researchers, and AI professionals. The mission of Morocco AI is to promote AI growth in Morocco and build a strong collaborative AI community, both locally and abroad. We seek to foster excellence in AI education, research, and encourage the innovative spirit. Morocco AI have launched different activities such as AI webinar series, study groups, and journal reading club. The AI webinar series aims to bring Moroccan AI researchers to present and share their work with the community. For today's webinar, Ihsan and I will be your hosts. Ihsan and I are currently PhD candidates in University Mohammed V and International University of Rabat. And also you can check our last webinars on our website or in our YouTube channel. Also, we are very delighted to organize our first annual AI conference on merging the gap between research and industry. The conference will take place on 21st to 23rd December, 2021. It's fully online and will include keynote speakers, workshops, data challenges, and many more. So stay tuned and check out the conference website for the latest news. And don't forget to follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook, and join us on Slack to be notified about our upcoming webinars and other activities. Our last webinar tackled boosting low resources languages technology with frameworks. If you have not watched it yet, please find the link in our website. Today's webinar is on distributional reinforcement learning for risk averse AI agents, presented by Ilyas Medic. Ilyas graduated from the Ecole Polytechnique and specialized in machine learning at the University of Oxford. He has AI R&D contributions with Oxford, IBM, and Amazon. His research work was published in ICML conference. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them on the chat on Zoom or YouTube, and we will make sure to bring them up at the end of the presentation. And please be sure to stick around for our networking session right after the presentation, where we will break out in smaller rooms so you get to meet and talk with some of the attendees. The presentation will last for approximately 40 minutes followed by 10 minutes screen days. Without further ado, Ilyas, please feel free to start when ready. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me fine? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Cool. So, uh, hello everybody, and uh, thank you for attending this talk. I'd like to thank Morocco AI for inviting me um, for this webinar. Without further ado, uh, let's get started. Um, today's talk is about distributional reinforcement learning for risk-averse AI agent. Uh, this project uh, is part of my uh, research internship at IBM Research Labs, uh, Singapore in 2019. Okay, so first we'll start by introducing reinforcement learning, uh, giving the key concepts and the key mathematical frameworks of it. And then we talk about the main algorithms uh, used in the field. Then we'll talk about the distributional perspective of RL, which is a uh, quite recent research that started in around uh, 2017. Um, we'll uh, talk about three uh, approaches, but we'll focus more uh, on the last one as uh, it is the one used for uh, the experiments. And finally, uh, we'll show how we leveraged those algorithms to implement uh, risk averse AI agents. Okay. So um, in machine learning, we have three main uh, categories. Uh, the first one is supervised learning, where you're given uh, data with labels and uh, you're supposed to train a model that learns uh, the patterns of this data and tries to predict the labels from the training labels that you 
train it with. And then you have unsupervised learning, where you typically uh, are given a data uh, without any labels, and you and the model, um, most commonly, uh, it's a clustering model, gives um, additional features like the cluster uh, number, and uh, commonly uh, clusters the data. And then you also have semi-supervised learning, and uh, in which uh, reinforcement learning falls. So uh, in the case of RL, you have an AI agent, which is this robot here, that will interact with uh, an environment. So uh, the robot is in a state S, it takes an action A, and um, it interacts with the environment and is given a reward R and a new state S prime. I'd like to stress here that the reward R is a random variable. It's um, not some kind of uh, function. And uh, the, new the, the new state S prime is stochastic, which means it is determined by a uh, transition probability matrix um, given state action pair uh, SA. Okay, this is quite similar to uh, training a dog, for example. Um, you, in this case, the dog would be your agent, the environment would be the place uh, in which you are and you. The reward would be giving it a treat or uh, showing it you're angry at it. And uh, an action, for example, uh, is to attack or fetch an object. And um, so uh, at the beginning, if the dog is untrained, uh, it will uh, perform uh, random actions. And this brings us to the uh, exploration exploitation uh, dilemma or trade-off. So at the beginning, uh, you can't just talk to your dog and explain to it uh, that it needs to fetch uh, an object. So you convey the information through the reward function. So the reward, uh, either giving it a treat or uh, being angry at it and um, at the beginning, the, the dog uh, doesn't have any idea about its environment, so it needs to learn. And the way it does it is by performing uh, random actions. But if you have um, a trained dog and uh, you say attack, it will uh, directly attack because it's trained and it is more into the exploitation rather than uh, the exploration. Uh, so uh, keep in mind, at the beginning, we don't have any information about the environment, so we're, we explore, we perform random actions, but when we are more trained, we reduce the exploration and we're more into exploitation. We try to take actions that will maximize the, the reward. Okay, so um, we'll talk about Markov decision processes, which are the key uh, mathematical frameworks of reinforcement learning. Uh, an MDP is a tuple uh, that comprises uh, S, a set of states that could be either finite or infinite, A, uh, a finite set of actions, B, a transition uh, probability matrix that determines from a state action pair SA, what is the next state uh, to take, a reward function, which is the expected value of the reward. Remember that this reward is a random variable and it depends on the state S and the action A. Okay, and then we have the discount factor, gamma, usually uh, a real number uh, comprised between zero and one, uh, most commonly closer to, to one, around the 0 0.9 or 0 0.99. And um, we define the return ZT, which is the total discounted reward from time step T. Okay, so that is basically uh, the reward at uh, the next time step. And uh, we multiply the further rewards by a gamma uh, to the K. So a gamma here kind of uh, incorporates uh, the interest rate, uh, which means that um, if you're if you're going to give me a reward of 100 now, I'd prefer it right now. Or uh, if you want to give it to me in uh, 10 days, uh, then I'd like uh, 200 uh, rewards to kind of arbitrate between uh, the two rewards. Okay, so uh, this just means that we prefer rewards now and we're not interested in the rewards um, in the further uh, uh, time steps. Okay, 
uh, that brings us to Q learning. Uh, we start by defining the policy, which is uh, basically um, the probability of performing uh, an action A given a stage S. And this is exactly what we want our AI agent to learn. If it learns the policy, then uh, we say that um, the AI agent is trained. Uh, then we have the Q function, which is the expected value of the return function that we saw earlier. Um, and uh, it's starting uh, at stage S and the first action we're going to take is A. We only define it this way because we're going to need it uh, later in our mathematical uh, definitions. And uh, the expected value, it, re it with uh, respect to the policy pi, which means that um, the, the actions taken in the further time steps are with respect to the policy. Uh, we also define the Bellman operator, which is uh, defined as follows. So if we have uh, a, Q, uh, a Q function Q of X of XA, then uh, the Bellman operator of that Q function is basically the reward, the current reward plus gamma and uh, the Q function for all the next uh, time steps. If you remember in the previous slide, so right here, we have the sum uh, that is infinite. It goes uh, up to infinity. So what we did here is that we just got out the first reward plus the, the, the other terms of the sum. So uh, that's what's happening uh, in here. OK, we also define the Bellman operator uh, for the optimal policy, uh, where this time we have the expected value that is going to take um, the max the the action that will maximize the Q function, um, as as opposed to the previous one that's going to take the expected value with respect to the policy pi. Okay, so uh, this second one we're, we're, we're is going to take uh, the action that maximizes uh, the Q function, and then we have theorems that show that when we apply iteratively the Bellman operator over Q, then this will converge to uh, the Q function corresponding to the policy pi. And uh, if we apply the Bellman operator, that is the second one, uh, iteratively, then uh, it will converge to the optimal Q function. Okay, this Bellman operator uh, is a contraction, which means it, it is um, a Lipschitzian uh, function. Uh, of which the parameter, the Lipschitz parameter is uh, strictly lower than one. And in fact, this parameter will be lower than gamma. That's why we take uh, gamma lower than one in order to have uh, a contraction. Okay, so uh, we saw how to update um, the Q function using the Bellman operator. We also saw that when we apply iteratively the Bellman operator, we're going to have the optimal Q function. So how do we actu actually uh, do that? When we have a finite uh, set of, uh, um, of states, like in here, and a finite set of actions, we can use a very simple algorithm, which is the Q table. So we start by initializing the Q function of all the state action pairs to uh, random uh, values or zero, like in here. And uh, the thing is, we're going to apply um, the Bellman operator of each uh, to each state action pair in order to um, update it and to converge to the true value. Uh, however, how are we going to do that? Because uh, remember, we don't have any data at the beginning. So the way we do that is that we put our AI agent in its environment and we're going to let it uh, interact with the environment using rollout simulations. So uh, as we saw earlier, at the beginning, the agent doesn't have any information about its environment nor about the reward function. So the thing is, at the beginning, it's going to perform random actions in order to discover um, the underlying patterns of uh, its um, environment. And um, 
we're going to update uh, progressively the Q functions of each state action pair and uh, reduce the exploration uh, rate um, in the rollout experiments, which means as we um, update the Q function, we're going to explore, uh, to uh, exploit more and more and take non-random actions um, but we'll go, we're going to take uh, actions that maximize the current Q function approximation. Okay. Now uh, we know that uh, neural networks are excellent approximators. And uh, at the end of the day, we're just uh, approximating the Q function in the reinforcement learning. So uh, deep Q learning, uses uh, neural networks in order to approximate uh, the Q function. OK, that's the exact same idea uh, of the previous slide. Uh, we initialize a, rep uh, a replay memory, D, and this will uh, contain the, episode, uh, the episodes, the uh, rollout simulations of our uh, AI agent. First, we initialize our action value function uh, with random weights, as we've done in the previous slide. And uh, here we start rollout experiments. An episode is basically um, a sequence of uh, state actions where the agent interacts with its environment. Okay, so we uh, start some uh, episode with an initial state S, and uh, we this, the length of this episode will be t time steps. So at the beginning, uh, we're going to uh, explore. So uh, with probability epsilon, we select a random action, A. Otherwise, we're going to select an action that will uh, maximize uh, the current Q function approximation. So here we, we exploit, and in the first line, we explore. OK, we execute the action uh, and observe a reward and a new state. OK, that brings us to uh, this tuple. We now have a transition uh, constituted of a state, an action, a reward, and a next state. We store that transition in the replay memory that basically stores the rollout simulations. And uh, then we sample a random mini batch of transitions from D. Um, and here is where the learning takes place. So we define the ground truth uh, as being the Bellman operator uh, updated uh, Q function. So if we are in a terminal stage, we just define yj uh, to be rj, which is the, the current uh, reward. But if we're not in a terminal stage, then we define yj as the Bellman operator. So current reward plus gamma, uh, the maximum reward that we could uh, get from all the infinite uh, time steps uh, ahead. And we consider that yj to be the ground truth. OK, that, that, is, that, that is the um, the thing that we're going to try to approximate with our uh, neural network. And uh, as such, we're going to apply uh, a gradient descent step on uh, yj minus the current Q, Q function. OK, this is just the MSC uh, mean squared uh, error loss that we apply at the end of our uh, neural network in order, to, in order for our um, Q function approximator to get closer to its uh, Bellman operator. And that's where the learning takes place. OK, um, the, okay, the standard uh, architecture of our deep Q network is as follows. If we have an image, uh, then so we input uh, the state to the neural network. In this case, uh, that's an image. It's going to get pre-processed into a convolutional uh, neural network to give a fully connected vector. That's then going to be uh, processed by the deep Q uh, network in order to give an output for each single action. So uh, the output size of our neural network is equal to the number of possible actions of uh, our AI agent. All right, so 
just to sum up, we have a state as input, and as output, we have the Q value, okay, the Q function of that state and uh, each action here. All right, so this was for uh, deep Q learning. And as we're going to see later in distributional uh, reinforcement learning, the idea is exactly, well, it, it's very close to that. Uh, at the, at the exception that instead of giving a single value for each state action pair, we're going for each action to give the whole distribution of the return function, the, the random variable, I mean. So instead of taking the average, we want the whole distribution. Okay, this can be done uh, in uh, many different approaches. Uh, the first one, is uh, the first paper that actually implemented uh, distributional reinforcement learning from uh, Belmar in 2017. So we defined the distributional Bellman operator that's uh, very similar to uh, the old one, at the exception that we have uh, random variables. So all that are stochastic quantities. Um, okay, so the idea here is that we're going to make some assumptions on the return function. Uh, we're going to suppose that the return function is in a fixed range. Let's say, for example, the, the return function is uh, comprised between minus 500 and 500. OK, that's a hard assumption that we do uh, to apply this algorithm. And the way we're going to update, um, to update our uh, network is that, okay, when we apply the Bellman operator, we uh, multiply uh, the return by gamma. So we shrink our distribution. You can see uh, that as the histogram of the return function. Okay, we multiply by gamma, we shrink our um, return function. Then we, are, we add R, the reward, so we shift it. And then we will apply uh, this function phi that will kind of project our um, updated uh, return into its initial fixed range. Okay, and then, so the idea is that the network will output for each state action pair um, probabilities uh, for each chunk of this uh, histogram, okay? So, uh, for example, for this chunk, I'll output a probability of 15% for this one of uh, probability of 2%, etc. Okay, uh, this is the C51 algorithm that implements that. I want to go into many details um, in order to focus on uh, the last approach, but basically we uh, output um, the probabilities of each chunk of the histogram. Uh, of course, the, the Q function, which is the average, is just this sum. We can always retrieve the average from a distribution. It's just the mean. Uh, we update using the Bellman operator, uh, and then we actually update uh, the probabilities of being in each uh, chunk of the histogram. And this is the way uh, it is updated. So uh, the M's here, are supposed to be the ground truth probabilities that we want to learn. And the P's are the um, predicted probabilities that are output by our neural network. So uh, this uh, form, uh, this expression is actually the general form for cross entropy loss with the uh, many classes and um, uh, ground truth probabilities and predicted probabilities. Okay, uh, so uh, I've actually implemented this algorithm, but it wasn't given um, quite a good results. So um, yeah, so that's why we, we uh, experimented uh, other uh, algorithms like this one, uh, the GANs Q learning. So here we leverage GANs generative adversarial networks in order to do uh, distributional reinforcement learning. Very quickly, the idea is that we have uh, a generator and a discriminator. The generator will uh, output uh, the return uh, function, and the discriminator will try to guess whether 
uh, this return function is is a generated one or if it is a ground truth one. And the, as always, the ground truth is supposed to be the Bellman target, which is the Bellman updated uh, return uh, function. And uh, of course, uh, in GANs, you always have conflictual uh, objectives. It's one versus uh, another. And uh, the idea is that the generator will update uh, its parameters using a gradient flow uh, into uh, the, the weights of the discriminator uh, network. And uh, a good thing about this algorithm is that it will automatically uh, perform uh, exploration uh, at the first steps because uh, the generator is random and it's, it has got no idea on um, the environment or the reward function. Okay, uh, I've actually tried this algorithm, but it was taking too much time because it's GANs and uh, you have to watch the gradient of a uh, network with respect to the parameters of the other. Plus you have a regularization term here that's quite complicated. Uh, uh, I think it was the, the L2 norm of the gradients of the discriminator function. So uh, it needs uh, a lot of computational resources. And uh, that's the paper that uh, we run experiments with. So uh, the third idea, so uh, yeah, in the, in the previous uh, slide uh, using GANs, how do we actually uh, perform distributional reinforcement learning? Well, it's simple. Uh, the generator will output random uh, values. So you kind of get the distribution of um, the Q function by simulation. Okay, and the, in the third approach, uh, that's a different approach. So for each stage action pair, you're going to have the distribution by uh, getting the quantiles, right? So if you, have, uh, let's say, for example, uh, the deciles or the, well, if you have the deciles of um, probability uh, distribution, uh, then you have uh, basically the, the whole distribution because uh, you can basically uh, draw the PDF of um, your random variable by first putting the values of the quantiles and then connecting the dots. And uh, here you have the PDF of the random variable. So um, how do we actually do that? Uh, using quantile regression. Okay, so uh, our network here will output the quantiles. If, for example, we have n equal to 10, then we have the minimum which is the 0% quantile, the maximum 100% quantile. Uh, you have the 50% quantile, which is the median and other quantiles, 10%, 20%, et cetera. Uh, the Q function, which is the average, is just uh, the sum. You can always have the, uh, the average or the mean using the quantiles. Uh, the action uh, that maximizes um, the Q function can easily be retrieved. And here is the Bellman update that you perform on each single quantile. Okay, and then you're going to update your uh, network that's uh, outputting the, the quantiles. You do that for each quantile. So uh, for each I here, the update will, um, uh, it will update the ith quantile. And um, in, quilt, in quantile regression, you have this function uh, rho uh, with respect to the quantile cho. And I'll just briefly explain why, why this yields um, the quantile. So if u is equal to this Bellman operator minus the current output, if we take, for example, so equal to zero, which means we want the zero quantile, uh, which is the minimum, then um, if u is, 
is lower than zero, which means <coughs> if our current output is greater than the Bellman uh, operator, it's greater than the Bellman operator, which means it's not the minimum, but we want it to be the minimum because we're in the zero uh, quantile. So uh, this Dirac will be equal to one and the absolute value will be equal to one and will actually uh, update the, the weights. However, if our current output is lower than the Bellman operator, which is, th this is good. I mean, it, it's meant to be the minimum, it is lower. Okay, so we don't update anything. Then this Dirac will be equal to zero. Cho is equal to zero, then we don't have any update to do. And the same reasoning can be done over other uh, quantile values. I won't uh, do that, but uh, I'll let you convince yourself uh, uh, about that later. Okay, so, uh, right. So now that we've explored uh, the approaches to perform distributional reinforcement learning, let's talk about how we leverage that to create risk-averse uh, AI agents. Okay, um, we talked about the distributional Bellman operator, and the, the, now the thing is that we want our agent to be uh, risk-averse, and as such, it won't uh, take the action that maximizes the whole uh, average of the Q function, but it will uh, take an action that maximizes the worst case scenarios. So it will optimize the worst case scenarios, which means it will take the average only of the first um, half, for example, of the distribution of the return function. This is called uh, the CVAR, conditional value at risk, and it's well known in finance. That's not theoretically the best version uh, in average. However, uh, however, it is the best that, op that optimizes the first quantiles of the distribution. Okay, here, let's suppose this is the distribution of our return function. Instead of uh, optimizing over the whole uh, average, we'll actually cut the cut this part and only look at the leftmost part and take its average which could be somewhere between somewhere in here and we'll actually uh, optimize over this part forgetting the rightmost part okay so we only care about the worst case scenarios the cases where the reward is very low okay for a risk averse agent uh, we only optimize over the leftmost part for risk taker agent, of course, we're going to optimize over the rightmost part. And if we want the classic version, we can retrie retrieve it from distributional reinforcement learning by optimizing over the whole distribution. Okay, the environments uh, that we use that on. Um, so we have some non-risky environments that I won't uh, talk about because it's not interesting to have a risk-averse agent in a non-risky environment. And this also shows in the experiments. Then we have Karchpol and Lunar Lander uh, in which we're going to apply vanilla DQN and uh, also quantile regression DQN uh, with the safe uh, versions. Okay, this is Lunar Lander. The goal is to land between the flags without crashing. Um, you get a huge reward when you land between the flags. You lose rewards when you fire uh, left, right, or down engines. You have four actions, left, right, down, or standby. Uh, okay, that's it. So, um, yeah, you have uh, good rewards for landing, uh, very bad reward. Uh, so the reward is sparse and uh, a high negative uh, reward for crashing. Okay, we have to remember that. So that's a risky environment. Uh, and we'll see that the safer the version, the longer it needs to train and um, the, the safer it is. Okay, safer versions will avoid landing when approaching the ground because it's afraid to kind of crash or touch a spike or something. Okay, and the, the fastest versions uh, are uh, the, the, the risk shaker ones because it's just interested in landing. Let's look at the experiments. So this is the classical uh, DQN. This is the normal DQN. That's not the same version, vanilla DQN. We see that it's 
quite fast, it lands well, no problem. Okay, then we have uh, the risk averse agent that will optimize the first half of the, of the return function distribution. <coughs> we already see that it takes um, more time than the vanilla DQN uh, to land. Even though it approaches the ground, it is afraid to touch a spike or crash. So it takes its time. It is, um, yeah, it's supposed to be safer and uh, it seems to be more uh, prudent. Then you have uh, the extremely risk averse uh, lunar lander that will only optimize the 20% first quantiles. So only optimizing the 20% um, worst case scenarios. And we see that it takes even more time to, to land. It's almost like it's kind of uh, afraid to, to land, to, to crash or touch a spike as we saw before. Okay. Um, so that was Lunar Lander. Uh, now we apply some Monte Carlo uh, on the episodes from vanilla DQN and uh, our safe policy. We see that the vanilla DQN can achieve a very high reward as opposed to the safe policy. Uh, however, it can also uh, fall into some worst case scenarios. But when we look at our safe policy, it doesn't go into those worst case scenarios. So uh, the price to pay in order to be safer is that on average, we're a bit lower than the vanilla DQN. However, it can have uh, its application as we'll see later. The second experiment is a cart ball. So the goal here is to keep the bar vertical. I won't uh, spend too much time on that. Um, so the reward is sparse again because you have a very bad reward if you uh, if the the bar falls, and uh, it shows some quite paradoxical behavior as we'll see. So let's look at uh, classical DQN. So uh, this is DQN applied to Karchpol. <coughs> we see that you know uh, it oscillates. It's not very stable but it does the job. Now uh, let's look at a cart poll that only optimizes 20% first quantiles of the, of the worst case scenarios. Uh, you see it shows some um, paradoxical behavior. So if it goes out of the frame, it will lose, uh, but it still does that. It goes very close to the frame. However, it, it shows a uh, very high stability as opposed to the previous one. I don't know if you noticed, but it is very stable. Um, yeah, it can have uh, something to do with um, the leftmost tail of the return function of that environment. But yeah, it's supposed to be um, risk averse. So it's uh, very stable. Okay. Now to conclude, uh, intuitively uh, our safe RL agent uh, works better with risky environments. There's uh, kind of no need to use it for non-risky environments. Uh, theoretically, uh, it has something to do with the leftmost tail of the distribution of the return uh, Z. Uh, it has, yeah, so risk taken policies have uh, poor performances. We haven't seen it here, but um, it does. There are also some theoretical results that show that worst case optimization yields better theoretical performance bound for the average case under a function approximation. We can also think of other, let's say, non-brutal ways of uh, optimizing um, a risk averse agent. Uh, for example, instead of pruning the, the distribution and only looking at the leftmost tail, we could, for example, opt for a weighting average. For example, we could we could weight higher the leftmost tails uh, and uh, weight lower the rightmost tail. Uh, this way, we could uh, keep the information about the best case scenarios as well, but uh, um, weight more the 
worst case scenarios. Okay, as for the applications, uh, it's mostly uh, the sensitive fields where we want to avoid at all costs uh, the worst case scenarios. We could think of uh, medical surgery, uh, I mean, AI medical surgery, uh, security, uh, finance, where we want to um, avoid at all costs uh, bankruptcy, for example. Okay, so that brings us to the end of uh, that talk. I'll just give you a brief um, introduction of my uh, background. Uh, I've done the preparatory classes in uh, Mule Yusuf uh, near Rabat. Then I enrolled the Ecole Polytechnique, where I eventually specialized in uh, applied math. Uh, then I've done a master's uh, in statistical science in Oxford. And uh, finally, I've worked with uh, Amazon, still R&D in AI. And um, that project was uh, part of uh, my uh, research internship in uh, IBM, and it's currently being published in Triple AI. Um, I have a research contribution uh, with Oxford that's published in uh, ICML. And uh, I am currently working on uh, side projects. Uh, and I'm a machine learning uh, freelance. So don't hesitate to um, write to me uh, if you have uh, any question. And uh, if you're interested to learn more about reinforcement learning, I would highly recommend uh, those materials. So, uh, you know, machine learning is uh, research is growing as, at a very fast pace. So I always prefer recent courses. So you can just type on YouTube, uh, reinforcement learning Stanford, and you'll find the course of 2019. Uh, you can, of, so uh, that's really available on YouTube. You can of course check the more uh, mathematical material on their website, CS234. And uh, I also recommend uh, the course of uh, DeepMind uh, with UCL. It's a 2021 course. Okay, thank you for your attention and the floor is open for questions. Thank you very much, Ilya, for the enriching presentation. It was very interesting and we surely learned a lot from you. Uh, we also have a few questions here. So the first one from Yasir saying, hi, I want to thank Morocco AI and Ilyas for this instructive webinar. I heard about ARL, but never knew how it works. So thanks for the explanation. I wanted to ask Mr. Ilyas if our uh, um, ARL is used only for games or does it have other applications? Um, actually, it has a lot of uh, applications. That's true that the first applications uh, were mostly games or it's, it's famous for its uh, Atari uh, games um, competitions. Uh, versus other AI algorithms. But uh, yeah, I mean, it could have also more uh, theoretical uses. For example, um, I've kind of used reinforcement learning uh, on actually my Oxford uh, uh, dissertation and it, it had uh, nothing to do with uh, games. It was uh, a Bayesian uh, framework for optimizing um, experimental designs. So yeah, it has uh, a huge uh, spectra of, uh, of uh, users. All right, thank you very much. We also have another question saying, can we apply it to autonomous car uh, to enhance the security? And does um, uh, RL for risk averse environment increases the complexity? Yeah, you can definitely use it for uh, uh, autonomous driving cars because yeah, that's a risky environment and you want to avoid the crashes at all costs, right? And um, well, it does increase the complexity. I mean, you the output of your neural network, uh, its size is multiplied by the number of possible actions. So uh, it increases the training time and uh, also the inferencing time. All right, thank you very much. So that's it. I think the presentation was crystal clear. That's, we don't, that's why we don't have uh, many questions. 
but I'm sure that they will be asking you a lot of questions uh, on the breakout rooms um, in a while. So thank you very much. And I will leave the floor for Iman. Thank, thank you, you Ilya. Thank you, Ehsan. So now we can move to the breakout session.